Um, so a, a big welcome to Everyday Creative, to everyone that's tuned in. It's great to see you. This is officially our launch, although we've had Paul and I have had a couple of uh, podcasts or webinars leading up to this, but this is the moment we've decided to do something which will have a, a bit of a rhythm and we'll explore more deeply about what creativity is. Paul, I'm doing all the talking. Do you want to say hi? Oh, hello, everyone. I was actually just doing it in the chat box. So, <laughs> um, multitasking. Um, <laughs> yeah, hello, hello everybody. Um, so, um, to give you a bit of a background, this is a, this is a fortnightly webinar. We're planning a podcast as well. Um, um, I'll ask Paul to introduce himself if you haven't met him before. Um, my background is I'm a thought leader. I specialize in helping companies create capture and communicate great ideas. Um, but I'm also a photo artist and so um, that's what's brought Paul and I together because we're both artists and thought leaders and we, we share a passion for creativity as well as helping people. Think. Paul, tell us a bit more about yourself. I'm the same as Chris. <laughs> so I'm a thought leader around creativity. My, my background is I've been an architect for most of my career but I've done many other things. Uh, I'm, I'm also an artist. Uh, I've run TEDx Brisbane for about five years, about five years ago. Um, I've been a property developer, a tech chair. I've been all sorts of things. So I had one foot in business and one foot in creativity my whole life. And uh, so, as Chris said, we connected. And the sort of commonality is this creativity, but it's also this thing about everyday creative where uh, Chris takes a photo every day. I let him talk about that, but I uh, do a, a watercolour every day and a posting. So, and that's really what we're, what we're looking at. And it's... And there's two parts of that. One day, one thing is just about a creative habit, but the other thing is to try to demystify to a degree um, creativity to make it like an everyday thing. Um, so it's not, you know, like you know, so it just becomes embedded in, in your life, I suppose, and then you work. So that's um, probably gone a little bit further, Chris. But um, back to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. we've got some stories to tell. I mean, I've been out taking photographs this very morning, which is something I do every morning. We'll talk about that. And Paul, I know, has done a watercolor in the last 24 hours. Uh, a bit of a bit of housekeeping for everybody that's tuning in. Um, uh, this is using Zoom's meetings facility rather than its oh, yeah. So um, if you could please pop your microphones on mute. Um, I could probably do it from here yeah. as well. Um, pop your microphones yeah. on mute. Um, there may be moments we want to hear from you. We'll, we'll unmute you or you can unmute yourself. But microphones on mute is the first one. Um, we'd love to hear your chat, your feedback, your comments and questions. So if you could set your chat box to everyone, including hosts and attendees, um, if it's not already there, everyone in the meeting, my one set to. So when you type a question, everyone can see it. Um, we're going to give you lots of opportunities to ask questions um, through the chat box and or live. But our suggestion is that you wait. So we prompt you. What do you think of this? Tell us about that rather than just chatting in things. The reason is that it helps us give you a nice kind of flow in the session. And if we're looking at questions and trying to chat, it, it makes it complicated. But so we will prompt you. There were moments when we're gonna go, tell us what you think, what's your feedback and ideas. Um, let's start with a quick go in the chat box. Uh, I can see we've got some, some really interesting people online. If you could just chat now, write, write your name. Well, I think it says your name already. Tell us where you're listening from. Where in the world are you in Sydney? Are you in Melbourne? Are you in Brisbane? Are you overseas? Um, chat away. Let's let's see who we've got online. There's Jeremy from Brisbane, Melbourne, Audrey from Sydney. I'm in Sydney as well, Audrey. Jackie from Melbourne, Adelaide. This is brilliant. A really nice spread across Australia. We'll wait to see if we got. Um, Oh, come on, uh, we're going to have to ask Tony how you pronounce that in Brisbane. Maybe you've got a pool, you know. Um, and then somebody's saying this, changing the Zoom ID. Ah, it's Kirsten, Kirsten from, from Azahi. Fabulous. Welcome, Kirsten. Thanks for the emailing me as well. I know you're going to have to duck out. It's really great. Be so, so welcome, everybody. Um, that'd be great. Um, we're conscious this is new. We thought we should introduce ourselves. Uh, Paul, why don't you just tell us, what have you been up to this week? Give us a flavour of what you do day to day. Any excitement in your life for the last week? Well, uh, I start my um, day with a with a watercolour, um, and I'm finding that that habit it sets me up for the day. And like a lot of things, you know, I do a lot of admin and things like that. And I just know that if I've done that one thing in the morning, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter what I did. I know that I've created something. I'm going to talk about that uh, briefly. 
the other thing is I'm just in the process of setting up a, an online workshop about a credit, creating the future that you want. So I'll hope to launch that in the next couple of days. It'll be probably, it'll just be 12 people. There'll be a half hour clarity call beforehand, then a two and a half hour workshop uh, through this process I've been running for years about clear, getting clear on the future as well as an overlay of you know what that future might look like. So that's what I'm doing. Um, in terms of my, uh, what's, that, what's that? Are you going to get people to draw in that workshop when they're creating their own future? No, don't tell them that, Chris. They won't register. If they have to know, they have to draw. <laughs> Yeah, well, but they don't have to show. They don't have to show. The, they don't have to show the drawings. Um, so, but I just wanted to. I just wanted to share something. So, I, I do a weekly uh, newsletter. Uh, if you, if you're at all interested uh, in in receiving it, uh, pop your um, <clears throat> pop your uh, email address in in the chat box. But I, I, I combine my my drawings with my thinking. And so this year, uh, this week, it was uh, uh, a thing called um, "When Life Gives You Lemons." Um, so what it was about was it was about uh, choices. It was about three choices and I, I won't go into it, but it was, it was a bit of a story about it. So what happened was, um, and it had, you know, this was the three choices, the three lemons, and you know, it's about, uh -huh. what it's about, it's about uh, accepting, walking away or trying to change. They're the three choices and particularly the time. But then I, I had a, uh, a, a phone, uh, an email from a, a, a dad from the school who I hadn't seen for a couple of years. And he said, oh, Look, I loved your post. Uh, a few days ago, my parents got a big bag of bush lemons. So I've made lemon curd. And so if you remind me of your address, I'll drop you around a jar. Um, <laughs> so he did that, which was just absolutely lovely, which then gave me my inspiration for my uh, this morning's post, which is um, when life gives you lemon curd. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, so that's it. So, and, and look, I suppose the thing is, as I said, you know, for me, this daily practice is really about, you know, reminding myself that I'm creative and that, you know, and it helps me during the day to, to reconnect. If I don't start with it, it's like not starting with a walk or, you know, meditation, whatever you do in the morning. It just, it's my, I suppose it's my creative breakfast, you know, it's just yeah. it's a mindset, it's my creative meditation. Uh, so therefore I can find other ways during the day that I can uh, apply it to creativity. So um, that's what I've been up to. Chris, what have you been up to? Um, well, like you, I'm out every morning doing something creative. So I, I take a photograph every morning and I post it on a Facebook and Instagram site. If anyone's interested, it's called This is Balmoral. Um, I shoot the same beach every day. That's my little discipline to apply my creative to that one beach um, so that it forces me to, to be more creative. I had great fun this morning. It was a beautiful sunrise right here, and I loved it down there. Um, and it's, yeah, it's kind of like my creative breakfast. I, I think what I try and do when I'm shooting is study my own behavior and work out how to apply that to work. And, and actually in this last week, I've, I've now launched two online masterclasses, which I, I'd had a blockage for doing and it's helped me to do that. Uh, so I've got one coming up on storytelling. Um, we'll give you more details later on. One coming up on how to run great workshops, whether they're online or face-to-face. -face. Um, so that morning creativity has helped uh, me overcome a particular blockage. So that's been, been my week so far. Two new products launched and some fun photography. Um, why don't we get into, I think we've covered it a bit, but uh, Paul, why don't you tell us a bit more about what, what Everyday Creative is about and the theme that's going to be running across all these webinars over the coming weeks and months. Yeah, look, um, for, for me, it really is, as I've sort of already, I suppose, uh, preempted. It's about getting, you know, in contact or connecting with your inner creativity. Uh, for me, my, my story is that, you know, I've been an architect, which is a relatively creative profession, Tanya. Um, uh, a colleague on, online. Um, but the reality is that there's a lot of mundane uh, processes you still got to do when you're an architect. You know, and you still have people in there, the accounts people, the person on the front desk. And even, you know, if you're doing drawings and stuff, you spend a lot of time, uh, you know, drawing lines, albeit on a computer now, but, uh, you know, it's not all, you know, it's like, it's a classic 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, uh, and it's complex. Um, so for me, uh, you know, I've developed this thing I call pragmativity, and it's a scale between thinking, and we all live some on that scale. It's, it's a bit like, um, uh, being an introvert or extrovert, you know, I'm an ambivert, I'm in the middle. 
And it's not because I'm neither. I mean, sometimes I'm really introverted. Sometimes. Who knows his feet go down to the privy? If somebody's got their mic on, if they can put themselves on mute, that would be um, Anyway, so basically, so that's sort of my um, thing. And, and for me, I've been very lucky. I had supportive parents. Uh, you know, I was always artistic or maybe say some people said sensitive. Other people might have said temperamental. Um, but the thing for me was that what I also did as a child, I did a lot of performing. I did comedy skits and I was in plays and musicals and, and I think I told the story last week of how I was humiliated in my early teens in a musical and, and so I, I let it go for 30 years so after the last 10 years I've been performing again, I've been doing stand up which has actually led me to this thing that I'm doing now which is around speaking, so it's about being heard so I fully understand the thing that shuts down for us around being a very strong element of it uh, and so but I find that you know, one thing unlocks the other. So I failed English at school and now I'm a writer and the, the key for me has been doing my paintings with my writing. So because I'm doing that, it allows me to write of all things, you know. So so I suppose what I'm, you know, what I what I challenge people to do is, you know, is to find their creative thing. Um, often the thing that you've been avoiding your whole life, either because you're lazy or you're scared, or, you know, or uh, you know, frightened or, you know, whatever it might be. And that's the thing you need to really get to. Um, and I think if you can unlock that, it, it's sort of, it's pulling the thread and all of a sudden, you know, the whole thing starts to, to unravel in a good way and, and, you, and you, you demystify the creativity thing. So that's, uh, you know, in a, in a nutshell. So Chris, you, I, I know you've got a similar thing. Go, go you, uh, you, you, you go, Chris. But that idea that if you can unlock that creative idea, it doesn't just help you with your art or with photography, that it helps people at work. Um, even if you're, we were talking to Claire, she's a lawyer. Um, even if you're a lawyer or an accountant, one of these people whose jobs is about routine and discipline and structure, um, unlocking that creativity inside, you can really help your work as well as at home and so on. I think that's what um, everyday creative is kind of, is about, is the kind of exploration about use, exploiting creativity, if you like, learning about it and then using it every day. Um, so yeah, that's what these conversations are about. Um, why don't we dive into some, some actual um, learning about our audience? I, um, I'm, con I'm guessing everybody online listening in is interested in creative in some way, but I, I, let's just find out from you. We, we asked last time kind of how creative you are. Let, I'd love to know now how important you think creativity is in your job. Let's go one is not important at all, and 10 is it's a vital component of what, I, what my job involves. Let, let's hear some feedback from people. Um, what's, uh, what, what number would you award to the job you've got in terms of how important creativity is? One is not important, ten is very important. Let's see some numbers, please chat away. Wow, you've got a ten, an eight, six, seven, ten, to think differently, innovate and grow. Brilliant, thanks for that. Ten, some very high numbers. Whoa, this is from 10 times 10 from Samantha. Fabulous. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm learning here. We've got people very hungry for creativity. It sounds like it's, it's, it's critical. Curious to know what everyone's roles are. Well, that's a great question, actually. Um, thank you for that. From I don't know what your name is, but it's K-G-R-I-G-G. Um, it, well, let's follow up. Let's, let's see what kind of job roles you have. I would describe myself as a thought leader. Are you a... Finance person, a lawyer, are you a marketer, an innovation insights person, salesperson? We've got an in house lawyer, consumer experience manager, an architect, insights. Thank you, Nikki. Great to see you online. Um, draftsman, um, corporate comms, quality systems. Wonderful. We've got a huge range here. That's very interesting. Um, from the kind of classical, the more classically mark, uh, creative roles, you may say marketing, innovation, you know, insights. But, yeah, quality systems, in-house lawyer, change curator, Samantha, that's, that's the, I guess, my ultimately creative role. Brilliant. That gives us a wonderful sense of kind of what you're looking for. And I'm, what I'm hearing from this first, I want to know more. Um, Paul, why don't we dive in and talk about our creativity today? I mean, we, we've been out there claiming to be everyday creatives. And why don't we test ourselves? You know, you mentioned you've got an image this morning. I think it was uh, when life gives you lemon curd. 
tell us more about that image and then tell us what we can learn from that. Um, I, I couldn't paint an image like that. It looks gorgeous. But talk us through the process you went through. Okay. Uh, we've identified by the, we had a little um, theme. We talked we talk about creativity versus curation because I curate my images to get the uh, result, but you do one. So tell us more. Yeah, I'm going to go back to yesterday, uh, which was uh, a sprinkler, um, a sprinkler head. And the reason I just, you know, I, I paint everyday objects is the thing and I, and I concoct stories, but it's really interesting. And I went before, talked to before about writing, you know, if, when I did that image, as I'm painting, it's like a meditation. So I'm, I'm um, thinking about it and it really brought back memories of, my childhood because this is the sort of sprinkler that we had and we I grew up in Townsville we lived on a quarter of an acre and we had bore water so we had a lot of water it was our job to always be moving the sprinkler but you know it was such a big lawn that my father who was not a not much of a drinker used to used to spend the day you know a half a day mowing this lawn with his old Victor uh, you know no catcher back in those days and, but then he would sit down and have this very rare cold glass of beer and he he would have um, you know I just remember that the smell of the cut grass you know his sweat and, and the beer, and it's this sort of, it's this memory that's come up just from doing this little, little image. Um, and, and so I posted that. This one is probably one that I'm pretty happy with. Um, it's just one of those ones that watercolor is a little bit hit and miss. I was, I was told once by a teacher who refused to teach me watercolor because he said I've such a loose style. He said, you've got to always do eight to get one good one from eight. Um, I don't have time to do eight, so I just do one and I post it. And, you know, the whole thing about curation, and if we have time, I can tell another story about curation, but the whole thing about curation is that when you, um, as an artist, you really should curate your work. But on this exercise I'm doing, I've made a commitment to post one a day. Sometimes I do two or three, um, but normally I only do not particularly happy with the image. Uh, and I don't know if it's you know a good thing to try to you know rebuild my my artist profile, but it's quite incredible the feedback that I get of the ones that often I don't particularly connect with, that connects with people you know and it's and it's you know either the story or the image or oh my God you know that from my childhood I had one of those or or whatever it might be and so it's really interesting uh, this thing of of um, you know not curating which is a little bit different to what I would normally do. And it's very different to what Chris is gonna do and I'll hopefully Chris will ex explore some of his in a minute. But for me, um, there's a thing that I've, you know, I've learned over the years. It's about not just what you do, it's how, communicate, how you communicate what you do. And so when you communicate something and put it out to the world, you get feedback from the world. So one of the things that um, has come from my, my experience in this is uh, I started painting teacups I never painted teacups in my life, and all of a sudden, I've become the teacup portrait artist, and 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 I've now got Teacup Tuesday. I only do one a day, uh, but it's led to another thing, which was another blog, uh, another newsletter I did, my first newsletter three weeks ago, which I started um, doing these images, which is actually I do the image and I tear it in half, and then sew it back together again. Uh, and there's a bit of a story. If you look at my newsletter, there's a story about where that came from from a a painting that someone's uh, wedding present that took 10 years to paint. But anyway, uh, who got divorced and then I had to cut it in half and sew it back together again. Um, but th the point about it is, is that, you know, the, that, that image, you know, came from this idea of just doing teapots and teacups and people going, I love teacups, you know. And so it started this dialogue. And then I did this thing about, well, where we are now is, you know, when, when you put something together, you know, it's very important to people and you see a teacup that's been re repaired, you know, that's important. And there's a Japanese practice, his name I can never remember, where they do it with molten gold and silver, and it becomes the object becomes even more beautiful than it was before. So th that is that is you know to do with my process. But as I you know I suppose keep laboring the point is, um, you know this is developing something for me uh, around my thought leadership. Uh, whilst it's my creative practice, and it's you know it used to be a very personal thing, it's now become a public thing, and it's actually helping me. Uh, you know, unblock my thinking and, you know, and, and thinking about how this can be applied, you know, to your well, life. I'm going to jump in because I yep. feel like you've got yep. huge stuff to kind of to work with and to take out of this. So let me tell you what I, what I heard from that. First, you said it was kind of meditative and, 
And so what I'm learning first is if you're drawing, you're helping your brain process things. And maybe the act of drawing, it, in, you could then chuck away the image in a way. It's the act of going through that process helps you assemble your mind, your, your thoughts, and helps you understand what it is you're trying to achieve. Is, would that be one conclusion that we could draw from what you said? Yeah, look, definitely. And Chris, I do want to get back to your curation thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's this research, recent research over the last few years about the brain. It's not left and right hand anymore. It's three networks. The default network, which is basically best described as daydreaming, the uh, executive control network, which is the analytical side. Then there's a third network, the salient network, which basically is a gatekeeper between those two. So what happens is, um, you know, in creative people, you slip, flip between the two which is sort of a bit back to that pragmatic thing. But what happens is that, you know, if you can get into like a, like almost a flow state, and this is what happens to me, uh, you know, I'm doing something, it's meditative, and I'm in almost the default uh, mode of daydreaming. And at the same time, then I, you know, concrete ideas are coming up. And I think it's, it's a really important thing, but it's one of the most difficult things uh, traditionally that we faced in business because, you know, we, we don't often have, the time to sit and think, you know, you know, if you're a lawyer, Claire, you know, you know, maybe when you're in practice, you know, that whole six minute thing and, and, you know, in, in architecture, we have, you know, time deadlines, um, things like that. So it's incredibly uh, important. I think in now, you know, a lot of people actually have time to think, you know, we're all saving, you know, an hour maybe on, on uh, commuting time uh, and to remember that, you know, and that's one of the key elements I think we need to take forward that ability to, you know, to daydream a little bit and think because, you know, you know, it was always a bad thing at school, but it's a really important thing that we shouldn't forget. So I've gone off track a bit, Chris, but, but my, no, I my wonder, point I wonder, wonder, sorry, a whole lot more of a daydreaming happening at the moment with the whole COVID thing, because when we're at work, we're surrounded by these hard surfaces, these bright lights, these deadlines that, that encourage a certain kind of rational, kind of productive way of working. And I think what you're highlighting to me anyway is, is that there's a very important part of thinking which involves daydreaming and being a bit more in the flow. And it, there's no place for that at work, and yet it's a very important thing to do if, you're, if you need creativity in your job. Mm. And, and my point was maybe because we're all sitting at home, I'm guessing most people online are sitting at home, it's a much better place to be daydreaming and to, to think in a different way than you might have. Yeah. And look, I, I've been having some discussions with some large law firms and large accounting firms, and they're, they're talking about, you know, like allowing, you know, teams to, you know, have to mix that, you know, on-site and off-site work. Um, but the point that I've made, and for anyone, you know, it's sort of up at the top of a business, it's not enough just to sort of, you know, allow people to set the example. It's got to be really at a grassroots level of saying, we're going to change, you know, our, we're going to change our uh, culture. Uh, and there's one law firm, the guys really into climate change, and, and to say, look, you know, you need to embed it in the culture because if you just do it and say everyone else can do it, you know, other people will feel, you know, embarrassed or they won't, you know, they won't feel really um, as if they've given permission. And within six months, you'll, you'll feel embarrassed and you'll be back at work. You'll feel guilty. So, you know, because you think it's climate change. Which is mine, though, is if, if a company is saying to people, look, we want you to kind of understand that sort of dream light creative state, you think it's really important to get into that and to use it to help solve whatever business problems you might have. How do you avoid people just basically stopping off, getting on Facebook, paying for a couple of things, oh, that's me being dreamlike, you know, how do you actually deliver it as a thing rather than just, well, it's not work, so it must be having a cup of coffee or just heading out the door somewhere? I, I think in the end, it would come, come down to the productivity, you know, like I think, uh... You know, I think it'll, you know, like I think that, you know, what I've heard, you know, currently is that you know, I say to people, I say, how's it working? I say, it's great. You know, people are really being responsive, they're being productive, they're doing the work they need to work. Uh, but, you know, they, you know, some people are hating it. I, I, I saw it quite right at the beginning of it, you know, all you um, introverts re reach out to your extrovert mates because they don't know how this, this thing works. Um, uh, and, that's, and that's certainly, uh, you know, that, that, that's certainly me. But, which is a perfect segue, because we're talking cur curation, Chris. And yeah. as I said, I just wanted to reiterate before I go over to you, I think curation, curation is important. But at times, you know, especially when you're trying to, you know, have a discussion, 
sometimes you you know it's important not to curate your ideas and sometimes it's just best to get it out there to get feedback which will then take you forward from that so so that's that but chris i know that you know and i'm not a photographer uh and i know that you have a different view of this uh and um and i suppose yeah, it's so, not, so I'll, I'll explain my, how, how my my process work in as much as there is a process but um i've set myself a task of taking one photograph every day of this particular beach it's down the road it's a it's a lovely beautiful beach um it's a lovely place to take photographs um and i've been doing it for the last five years uh, and somebody asked me how long i've been doing it for the other day and i had no idea i don't count it up not ticking off the years but i did look back uh, so there's quite a lot of photographs of the same beach and there's about half a dozen shots you can take quite easily. Everyone knows you stand there and point the camera and get a nice clean picture, you like a postcard. So if you, for a week, it's an easy task because you know how to do it. But then week two, you can, oh, I've done that shot. So now what do I do? And week three, so I'm in year five or year six, technically it would be. So I've, I've done a lot of shots of that beach and I'm always pushing myself to see what else I can find. And oddly, one of the ways I push myself is, is to kind of relax. Um, and to not, uh, if, if, if you, there's too much tension, I must produce a great shot today, otherwise everyone will hate me. Um, it almost definitely doesn't work. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the story of a the shot I posted yesterday. I posted one this morning, um, but I prepared the one that was a, sh a shot from yesterday. Um, and it involves curation, which, which um, you alluded to me. I don't know if people can see this online. Um, I was standing around with a few, few buddies, and I, I wasn't thinking about photography or creativity and I spotted this bit of light just about to break through the clouds it was dark and cold and wet and just been swimming I was shivering a bit um, and I thought I'd, I love the way this light is looking it's a glary contrasty light and I took out a camera I always have a camera with me I've got a whole bunch of cameras some are broken because they're covered in sand and salt from my beach photography um, and I took this picture on the left um, and it, it, I, I was not very happy with it. <laughs> it's not very good. It didn't capture that glary, contrasty light, which is what had inspired me. Um, but I think the, the key is I know that, that it's rarely that first photograph that works. You, you have to get into it. You have to start to understand why you're excited by that light or by that scene. And, and it takes time to kind of build on that idea. So, so uh, somebody once said to me, when you're photographing, you've got to notice what you're noticing. And to ask yourself, why am I taking this photograph? What is it I'm seeing that's exciting? So for me, it was that light, that, that bit of sunlight there that's about to come through. And if you look at that picture, <laughs> it's not that. It just looks like a gray background or something with an umbrella. It's a really bit depressing picture. So I carried on shooting. I took 40 or 50 frames and for a digital camera, that's easy to do. You can do it in a couple of seconds with some cameras. Um, and eventually, I've got this shot on the right. You can see that I'm deliberately shooting people as they walk past, they give the whole picture some context. And what I particularly liked about this picture on the right was what the two figures are kind of uh, completely in sync with each other. You can see that they're, they're walking in time um, and the, the sort of triangle of their legs mimics the, the um, perspective on the, these marks on the pavement and the light's coming through much more powerfully. So, so that process of going back to the pictures um, that morning I put them on my computer and curating them and saying this one didn't capture what I wanted uh, and I, as I worked it, I worked it, I worked it I didn't know until I got back home that this was the image I was going to find so this image got posted yesterday and that image got rejected uh, and I think it's a very important piece of creativity certainly for a photographer, maybe we can talk about business, but is to, to be disciplined and to chuck stuff away so I've got many millions of photographs on my computer at home um, but only a few of them ever see the light of day. Uh, interestingly, I can't bring myself to delete them. I don't know why. I've never deleted a photograph in my life. Um, but, but I might have 50, 100 photographs each day, but only one makes the grade as far as I can see. There are moments I don't get anything I like, and so I, I said I'd post something every day. Um, I'm not as brave as you, Paul. I, I'll go right and not. There's nothing for me to show here. Um, and I, it's an interesting challenge to say that even if you haven't got stuff that you could be or you're proud of, why not publish it? Why not show it anyway? Because other people might appreciate it in a way that you don't. Um, 
So that's my process. And, and so curation is a key part of it. And so if you were going to literally interpret my process for the world of business, if you're trying to solve an idea, I would say that classic brainstorming thing, let come up with lots and lots of ideas. More is good. And then chuck away most of them because sooner or later you'll find one that's really good. And, and certainly in the world of business, I find the best ideas come after that moment that you get some stuff. So you, let's say you're trying to come up with ideas. We've got somebody from Twining's Tea online. So you're coming up with ideas for new kinds of tea. And it, the first ones are pretty easy and obvious. We've probably heard them all before. You know, we'll do an orange flavor. We'll, it's all about COVID at the moment. We'll do medicinal kind of teas. It's a pretty obvious route to innovate around. And then people run out of ideas. And that's the moment you're going to get a good one. You stop, force yourself. What else could we do? I think the best ideas come after you. Uh, so I'd love to hear from some people online. We've been contrasting these two styles. Paul publishes one a day, kind of come what may, and I'm taking lots of photographs and cherry picking, we could argue, the ones that I think are right to, to publish. What about the people online? I'd love some feedback. What, what have you learned from those two little stories about how we create every day? Um, oh, I, excuse me. Well, um, just, while we're, just we're waiting for that, yeah, there's just a couple of questions there. And I see one uh, from Jackie, uh, how long do you take? Um, Jackie, I, I probably take about, all up about an hour in the morning to do my, my piece. But, you know, that's also some thinking. And, you know, but I get stuff ready the night before, so it's ready on the table downstairs. It's the first thing I do in the morning. Because uh, it's watercolour, I've got to come and go. You know, so I, sometimes if I, you know, if you rush it, it doesn't get the result you want. Uh, but then I, I take notes as I'm doing it, uh, and then I tend to write during the day. So I'm, I'm a slow writer. So you know, over the length of the day, it might take me an hour, you know, to do two or three hundred words. So that's what I do. Um, Chris, how long do you take? Uh, yeah, um, um, half an hour, forty-five minutes, that kind of time. Um, yeah. It definitely takes time. I mean, the thing everyone's used to. I mean, everyone's a photographer these days, and we're used to going, "Oh, that's nice," and click. Here's my photograph, and that took two or three seconds. And, and I think it's very hard to take a photograph that, you, that captures an idea that quickly. Certainly you can capture a memory that quickly. And, and I love snapshots. And I, and I've, I love those crappy photographs of a, of a party or you know, you're on a walk and you just want to remember something. That's lovely stuff. But if you're trying to say something, it takes time to, to whittle into that idea. What is this and why? And how may they create an image that tells a story? Um, and doesn't just remind me of a happy moment. So yeah, half an hour, 45 minutes, that kind of time at least. Thanks, Jackie. I, and I just, I just see another question up there before we get to others. Uh, Peter, uh, hello, Peter, nice to see you here. Has asked, uh, I think I've been too much daydreaming at home lately. How do I get my product productivity up and more efficient? Hi, Peter. Uh, look, I, I personally, and I, I obviously, you know, suffer this same problem at various times. What I have found lately is what I said earlier, it's about doing this creative thing first thing in the morning uh, that just gives me an enormous amount of creative energy. Um, and then, then what I do, uh, and on this call is uh, another photographer, a uh, very good friend of mine, Paul Harris. And Paul Harris and I do a thing each morning, we uh, text each other um, three things we're gonna do today. Um, and then at the afternoon, we text each other uh, how we went, one, two, or three out of three. Uh, and then we do another text of what we intend to do the next day, uh, and we reconfirm it the next morning. Uh, at the beginning of each week, we give uh, uh, three things that we want to achieve that week, and we do the same for the beginning of the month. Um, and I have found that to be incredibly powerful because, you know, it's that whole thing of accountability, and I have been getting things like I've never, ever done it before. And I don't put on there, you know, do an Instagram post and an article. You know, like, I don't put that in there. And I, I have other things I try to do daily, and I try not to put them on. But if I'm falling back on those things, like, you know, do A B D call every day, then I'll put that on my on my task list. But you know, but to me, it comes to this thing of because you know I've spent so many years of you know doing architecture, but not really creating anything and not feeling fulfilled. But it doesn't matter what I'm doing the day. If I've done, you know, if I've done a sprinkling of creativity, so to speak, <laughs> uh, pun intended, um, then I'm basically, uh, it, I feel much more satisfied 
and then I can apply myself to get things done. So that's that's probably a long a long answer. Uh, so um, <coughs> anyway, back to I you. One, one answer I have for Peter is because you, you you're, you're saying well what happens if I spend too much time kind of daydreaming and I'm I could kid myself I'm that's a way of thinking and I'm exploring creativity but maybe I'm just bobbing off and not doing anything with my life. So how do I get kind of stuff out? One thing obviously that unites Paul and I is we kind of do this thing like clockwork every morning. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't put it on a to-do list if I, had, if I wrote a to-do list, because it doesn't sound like it's for me that's not a, um, not a task, <laughs> it's an outlet. It's something that I would, I miss um, hugely if, I, if I'm not able to get down there. Um, there's a couple of really good questions coming up on the side. One is, uh, where can you see my photos? Um, Facebook or Instagram, this is Balmoral. And that's the beach that I shoot each day. This is Balmoral. Um, mine, uh, of, mine's on, Facebook, Facebook uh, Paul Fairweather. Well, it might actually be Fairweather Paul. Uh, and my Instagram is everything with a K. Uh, because that's what I always said when I was trying to say everything. And my wife gave me such a hard time about it. I thought, I'm going to make it my Instagram thing. And then became a thought leader. So that's perfect. Everything. Um, so uh, if you want to check it out, please do. Um, so there's a really interesting comment from Tanya here. I've learned not to be too precious about my pieces. Sometimes I put them on the back burner and I come to them later. Um, and I, but my comment here, what you think, Paul, but my comment would be, oh, I find it very difficult not to be precious about my pieces. Each of my images is like a little baby. And uh, it's run me into trouble certain times because, as we all know, photography is not real art. It doesn't count. And people sometimes treat my photographs with the same respect that they would treat a snapshot. And that, that causes tension, if I can put it that way. Um, however, the idea of coming back to things, I absolutely agree. Let them melt, get, get some perspective on them. Um, this is a, an artist trick, Paul. I don't know if you do this as well. It's got nothing to do with business, but let me share it. Is if you have an image, um, that you've created and you're trying to decide what it looks like, turn it upside down and you then, it becomes an image that you couldn't have painted yourself. You lose your emotional connection with it and you can judge it much more objectively. Uh, going away from it, leaving it has the same impact. You come back and you go, oh, now I can see what this looks like. So if you're a visual artist, turn your images upside down to see what they really look like. Paul, do you do that? Uh, well, look, I, I don't, but um, I've talked before about a fantastic book uh, drawing on the right hand side of your drawing on the right hand side of your brain by um, Betty uh, Edwards uh, who's from California and she was an art teacher and if you ever want to learn to draw um, and you you know have that little voice in your head that says you can't draw uh, you know don't be stupid uh, get that book uh, it is fantastic um, and one of the exercises, what she does, and she, she used to run courses, and, uh, and she's quite old now, she might even have passed away, but um, she gets people to do a self-portrait uh, at the beginning and the end of this course. And the change is, is dramatic. But what she does is she gets people to um, draw uh, a photograph of a, a person, a, a, I can't remember who, who, who it is, uh, and she gets them to draw that. And again, it's this ridiculous thing. And this is going into a lot of detail, but what happens when we draw and her big thing is about, um, you know, and see, drawing is about seeing what's really there, not what you think is there. So what happens when we draw is people tend to, and I'm a bad example of this, but it's much better with someone with hair. Um, we tend to draw the eyes one third up the head. So we have one third, then two thirds. So you get these very long faces with this, you know, like almost cartoon. But the reality is that if you look at this, um, eyes are in the halfway. Um, so, uh, but, you know, and kids don't draw that way because what we're drawing is what we're seeing is, is the forehead. You know, as I said, I don't, I'm not a very good example, but, you know, with a person with hair, I must get a wig for this demonstration, Chris. Um, uh, that, that's, what, that's what happens. So what she then does is... Um, she then gets them to draw this thing. It's, you know, it's someone famous. Uh, and again, they do the same thing. And then she gets them to draw it upside down. So you turn the photo upside down and you draw it. And when you do that, it disconnects that, you know, let's say left-hand brain of, you know, what you think you're drawing. And you, you are forced to draw what you see. 
and the improvement on the images is like 100, 150% in that first ex exercise. So it's a little different, Chris, about looking at it. And I know exactly what you mean, because often when you scan something, it reverses, you go, oh, it's got a bit of a tilt to the right. I, I didn't mean to have that as, that was supposed to be symmetrical, you know? Um, but, but the thing is that that's, that is a really, um, you know, it's a really important thing. And, and look, in one of the exercises that I do, um, as Chris alluded to, I, I do a couple of drawing exercises. Um, it's not about that sort of, you know, representational drawing. It's just it's expression. It's about instead of doing a list, you're drawing something that you want to see because when you do a list again, the left hand logical brain kicks in, you know, for, for intense as the, the executive control network. So it's very important to um, to have this, you know, thing where you, where you can where you can disconnect. But ultimately, it's about seeing things differently. So when you're in that creative space, you're actually seeing what's really there and not what you're thinking there. And again, you know, back to the, you know, exercising the creative muscle or, you know, early in the morning, it's about looking, you know, it's about looking at this object and making a representation of it. And then as you go through your day, you look at things more clearly and, and I believe that it, it transcends just visual objects. You know, it, it, it transcends, you know, relationships or, you know, structures or whatever. And you can, you can just, you get a different view of the world. And I think that's the sort of um, application. In there, but I have it's a very interesting um, question for photographers that, and, and I, I do a bit of teaching of photography, because unlike a person with a paintbrush, camera is a machine it'll record exactly what's in front of it not what's in your brain it'll record exactly what's in front of it and i think what we what we both agree is whatever's in your brain is very different from what's really there and sort of all the different you know, things that go on we've been taught and so on like you know the eyes at the top of the head not in the middle those kinds of things but so when even, i'm but even that you've got different lenses and different filters which you know give you a different image uh you know if you've got they, a wide but my, my point is that um, the reason I would argue a camera is just as much a creative tool as a paintbrush is you, if you see something that, that you want to capture, you have to train this stupid, dumb piece of machinery called a camera. You've got to find a way of getting it to capture what you've seen rather than what it would just naturally do. And that's, what, that's the creative process is I've got this, this tool which left to its own devices and just kind of record shapes and things. But that won't be what's in your head. Your head will have a story, it'll have an idea, and you have to find a way of getting this machine to capture that idea. So uh, it's very much the same philosophy, but opposite, that I'm saying, make sure you, uh, I actually tell people with, with photography, you have to lie, cheat, steal, be devious to capture the idea, because the camera won't do it for you. Whereas I think maybe with your sort of, um, uh, a paintbrush, your your hand will do what's in your brain, and people might not understand what you're doing. So you have to kind of get back to kind of closer to what what a camera would see, perhaps by drawing upside down or whatever it might be. Mm. Actually, I just I just see a, a question, uh, uh, well, not an observation from Samantha, uh, that I pick a subject to show creativity, and you you find it, which I think is yeah, look, it is partly true. I've got to find my subject. <laughs> In the first place, uh, not every day that I get my jar of uh, sub jar of subject matter. Um, uh, so I've got to, you know, look around the look around the house. Um, but I think for me, and I and I think it's you know, I think there's a commonality here between what Chris and I do. For me, uh, it unlocks this this you know, unlocks my writing. That's the that's sort of the key thing, and unlocks my thinking. Uh, for Chris. It, it seems to unlock his eye because, you know, he showed me those photos the other day, the two that he did. And as I said, I'm not a photographer, you know, I would have been happy with one on the left. Uh, but when he showed me the two and explained it to me, I was like, yeah, actually, that left one is pretty crappy, you know. Uh, so, so I suppose you're, yeah, you are finding, you know, you're finding almost what you see in your mind's eye through the camera. You know, you, you, you have an image of what you want to create. But then you've got to find it in, in the physicality of the world. Yeah, yeah. And it's sometimes the, the challenge is you kind of know that there's something there you want to capture, but you're not sure what it is. And so you, you point your camera, whatever it might be, and, and you, that hasn't told the story I want to tell. It might be an attractive image, 
Uh, so this morning was a prime example. It was a pretty, pretty sunrise, lovely colours, all that stuff. Very easy to take a picture of a pretty sunrise. Um, and what's in my mind is that everyone takes pictures of pretty sunrises, and we've all seen lots of pieces of it. So, so why would I do that? I, what, what else can I do? How can I get something that that is more interesting, more challenging, tells more of a story? Um, so yes, I, I I think it's very important. It's, I'm looking in in the photograph. For the photograph to tell the story that I want to tell, and it might be a, a different photographer might say, "No, that's the image I like because I, I it tells the story I want to tell because of the transparent umbrella or because of this grey flat sky," and that would be fine. Ben, it's just, ben, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you're up for it, can we unmute Paul Harris to get him to make a comment? Oh, well, well, wonderful! Well, yeah, yeah. Paul, are you up for that? Paul, here you go, Paul. Yeah. Oh, uh, Paul, is, Paul, is, Paul is a, a great friend of mine. He's a, a photographer and my my task buddy. But uh, do you have a comment, Paul, on that? Uh, yeah. So we're sort of speaking to um, uh, perspective on on uh, on on what what we're sort of seeing before we're we're shooting and, and what we're we're trying to produce and and uh, and sort of where that comes from. Is that is that sort of kind of the gist of what we're, we're speaking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, it is very subjective. Um, um, I'm, I'm very precious about what uh, what I post uh, and what I what I put out there. Um, well, you're, very, you're very precious anyway. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I should just say, Paul, I, I've seen Paul, I've seen your work. It's fabulous, and you, you're I would describe as a sort of precision photography. It, it's exquisite and it's carefully considered and it's beautifully lit. And yeah. Yeah, it's vaguely scary having you on this. <laughs> oh, it's, it's very, very fun of you because I appreciate that. Um, but uh, your work's beautiful too, and, and I think the commitment to go out every day uh, and, and put work out there is, is uh, both of you actually is is, is uh, commendable as well. A good example for all of us. But um, uh, I guess sometimes it's, it's finding that the magic, and sometimes, uh, interestingly, so going off on a sidetrack, is when things actually don't go to plan. That that when sometimes that's when the magic happens as well. So you have an idea in your head, and I really want this picture. I really want this, you know, footstep or, or umbrella or what have you. And and then you know someone you know drives through a puddle, and then something completely different happens. And and so you've got to be ready for those those opportunities as well. Um, but I, but I think that's the, the beauty of creativity is that it's it's it means different things to different people and. Uh, and as you say, it communicates different ideas, you know, when you're putting work out there, um, you know, it just connects, connects with other people and, and, and fires them up as well. So. Paul, I, I kind of agree with that strongly. If you're, if you're working on an idea, say you, you, you can see a picture and you're trying to catch it in the camera, but at the same time, be ready for something else um, to go off plan. You know, I hadn't spotted that before. And oh, what mm. about trying this? Um, and it's, I, I quite cool. that, that they, they usually worry about the better. Sorry, sorry. In studio, I was going to say, but in the studio with your paintbrush, I'm guessing there's less opportunity for that kind of something. Someone drives through a puddle and you go, oh, that was gorgeous. Does that, is that true or do you still have those opportunities? Look, um, watercolours is all about puddles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oil painting is a bit different, but, you know, that's the whole thing about, you know, the one and eight, uh, which, I, which I don't do. Uh, I don't take construction very well, but watercolor, you know, is is about puddles, and it and it often is the happy accident. It, it's also, but in oils, um, you know, if if I have to draw something, um, you know, and then I paint something, there's and the, especially the way I paint, I basically mix on the canvas, and there's there's you know two colors blending and stuff, which is an accident, you know, and it looks fantastic, you know, but I didn't actually paint it you know like I, I painted it but it wasn't like i didn't mean to do it you know and i think oh, i'm gonna keep that i was just actually thinking um and uh we've got to start wrapping up chris but um uh, we've, we've got a subject where our next fortnight uh is about constraints but paul just said something there which i think would be a fantastic topic for future is uh you know what happens you know what good comes out of things when they don't go to plan and you know particularly in you know as we're sort of you know, hopefully getting to the end of this COVID thing, you know, nothing's gone to plan over the last, uh, you know, three months. So I think it'd be a fantastic, you know, topic for us to think about, about, you know, what are those, you know, happy, happy accidents um, that when things don't go to plan as a, as a future, future subject. 
I love that thought because I, I certainly agree with it too. That's why, for example, I love shooting on location, not on in studios, because it is a kind of antiseptic and very hard. Whereas, whereas the things don't go to plan, if you've got the right mindset, you know, just work with that. If, you know, so yeah, definitely, I think we should make that topic for a future session. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we should perhaps start to to wind up. We've got some wonderful feedback. With the idea of uh, sort of curation being like iteration, which is used in design. Thank you very much for that, Paul, Peter. Um, creativity is definitely an outlet, Tanya. I think, I think that's true, and I think everybody has that inside them. Uh, what I'm hoping we'll get out of these sessions is how we can get more from it than that, and how we can kind of use it. I mean, we keep referencing work, but I think more generally, how can we use creativity for Maybe it's mental health, maybe it's processing thoughts, maybe it's solving creative challenges, those kinds of things. Um, and, and Tanya has nailed the quote of the day from Paul. <laughs> Watercolour is about puddles. And I, I love that point. Um, I, you know, in a studio with a paintbrush, what could possibly happen that's spontaneous? And there you just described it. So that, that is brilliant. Um, any, before we start to, to wrap up, anything more from the people listening in? What have you taken out of this session? You can probably tell that Paul and I, and perhaps with Paul Harris as well, could rattle on for hours and hours. What have you taken out of the session, particularly, and how could you apply that to business? It all bleeds into each part of your life, yeah. It can be creative in your private life. It comes over to work, yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Very true, very true. So, um, uh, keep, keep putting in your, your feedback and your comments if you, if you can. Um, just a couple of things, but um, to kind of to wrap this up. Um, uh, in a fortnight's time, we're doing another one of these sessions, and I'd love it if you could all join us. Um, we had planned it to be about constraints. I actually think we've got a much better idea. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, we should talk about when things go wrong and, and how you can use that to advantage or how that can generate things that, that you didn't expect uh, might happen. It certainly happened to me in my photography. Um, so it sounds like we can, we can, that's a really rich topic to explore. So that's next, next time's topic. It's in two weeks' time. Um, uh, we'd love to pop you on our mailing list. Paul has a mailing list. I have a mailing list. If you're interested, pop your email address uh, in the chat box, and we can add you to the mailing list. If you want to on both, then just put your email address. If you, you think I can't, couldn't stand hearing from Chris, I'd love to hear from Paul. Pop, you know, Paul dash your email address, uh, and we can keep you in touch with sort of um, our thoughts on creativity and, and how to incorporate that into our lives. Um, quick sales pitch, if, you, if you're interested in one of my masterclasses, um, storytelling, um, morning of 20th of May, that's in two weeks time, half day session on storytelling for business, um, which does draw on some of my photography, but it's mainly about how you get ideas across the business audience. And the 27th of May, is on how to run kick-ass workshops. Um, and that's a half-day session. And they're online or face-to-face, -face, but it's how to get people to collaborate and generate creative solutions for business challenges. Um, Paul, remind us, your, your workshop hasn't got a date yet, but tell us what it's about. Yeah, look, it's, it's really about uh, creating the future that you want. Uh, it's about getting clear of where you are now and where you want to be, uh, looking through the filter of a, you know, a current circumstances. Uh, so it's a... There's some pre-work uh, about thinking about you know, what the future, future might hold. And then there's an exercise um, that sort of unlocks what you really want to do. And I've done this uh, workshop you know, many times always you know, face to face with people, but I always get one person going, you know what? I don't want to do what I'm doing at the moment. I want to do something else. And one person moved to Orange and you know, someone else. Has. So it's a little bit dangerous doing it in a company because you know, the bosses don't really like it when you get 10%, you know, <laughs> leave uh, because of, you know, you've given them this thing. But uh, look, it's a powerful tool. The, the session is really, you know, uh, for individuals. Um, but the, the really powerful thing is then uh, to do it with, with teams in businesses where teams work together. Uh, so I'm still working on how to do that on, online. Um, but then, you know, as a team, they can, you know, envisage what they want in the future. Um, oh, so I, I have a prediction. A prediction for you. I think it's going to be a really popular session because I think so many of us sitting at home have been reflecting on whether they want to go to work each day and do that job and whether they want to be at home or whether they've found new sides of themselves at home that they wouldn't have done at work. So 
I think that's a really, really big idea you are. Yeah, thanks. Well, look, I'll, I'll, you know, the details will be in my next newsletter, which uh, comes out every week on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> Certainly no later than Thursday. Um, well, not, yet, not yet anyway. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, so that's that, that's what it is, and um, uh, yeah, that's great. So, you know, if you're interested, drop me a line. Uh, I've got a, a, a sort of final thing, a challenge to everybody listening in. Uh, it struck me that if, if we've said we're going to talk about what happens when things go wrong in two weeks' time, uh, the challenge to everyone listening in, assuming you want to tune back in in two weeks' time, is just keep a mental note for yourself of if something goes wrong and how you react to it. Love to hear your stories, and maybe you burn the toast, which is something I do the whole time, by the way. Um, or, or maybe it's you know that massive business project which crumbles. You know, what went wrong? How did you react to it? And and did anything positive come out of it, or was it just an unmitigated disaster? So let's all of us be researchers in the topic of when things go wrong, and we can perhaps get lots more feedback uh, in two weeks' time. That's great. Um... Uh, just uh, Jackie just asked a question. Uh, do we get a link to this recording? Yes, uh, Chris will post the link to this recording. Uh, yes, I, do. I will. I will. Um, we're we're still exploring how to. Uh, last time I put the whole video onto YouTube, uh, probably that again. There's probably a much more efficient way of doing it. We probably need the audio. Um, on, I'll I'll work it out. I've got no idea how right now, but yeah, we will we'll, we'll publish it and make sure it's available. But Jackie, or anyone, you know, feel free to drop me an email. I'm Paul at paulfelder.com. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, um, you know, happy, happy, to, happy to connect. But, yeah, we will. We, we, well, the plan is to, to edit this down to be a podcast. Um, so we're hoping to do, do them, you know, do this once a fortnight. But then every other week we'll do a, just a, 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 verbal, a verbal thing. So, uh, look, I want to thank everyone for joining, especially some... some uh, old friends, Tanya and Jeremy, um, Troy, Paul Harris and Peter, uh, people that I know personally uh, and new friends. Uh, so, you know, thanks for, for uh, joining us and I I'm, I'm hope you've had a great day and just remember to uh, have your creative breakfast every yeah. day. Creative breakfast and watercolours. Watercolours are all about puddles. That's my big takeaways. Thank you, everyone. See you all in two weeks' time um, and send us emails. If you need anything, please get in touch. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.